Thank you, Brendan. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to be giving the genetic engineering talk, so it's put on my Monsanto t shirt. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go Monsanto. Um, but really, I work on GM mosquitoes, and um, when, you, when you study GM mosquitoes, you end up learning a little bit about GM food along the way. Uh, so I'm not going to be talking about those, it's something essential to my research, but uh, something I picked up. Um, this is the modern face of genetically modified foods, in case you didn't know. Charles Montgomery Burns. And for those of you who don't know who he is, uh, he's from a show called The Simpsons. And he spent his day thinking about how he can make even more money out of the general public. Most people, when they think about genetically modified foods, they envisage someone like Frankenstein. And it's true that we have to be exceedingly careful not to create monsters when we virtually get a piece of disparate organisms and bring them to life. But the truth is that the early creations of genetic engineering have been far more about making money than making monsters. And it's for that reason that I'd like to nominate Mr. Burns as spokesperson of today's GM food industry. But I'd also like to contend that it doesn't have to be this way. That um, you may remember a few, like a decade ago, people always talking about how genetic engineering could be used to feed the hungry. And these days, people hear these claims and they think to themselves, yeah, right, heard that one before. And quite frankly, rightly so, with people like Mr. Burns in control. But what I'd, yeah, what I'd like to argue is that what if we had a genetic engineer who actually cared about people, not money? An engineer who lived by the slogan, make love, not money. And that's love in the affectionate, caring, missionary position sense of the word. <laughs> what if Mother Teresa was a genetic engineer? <laughs> A colleague of mine, Luke Alfie, developed a mosquito strain to control dengue fever. And his company, OxyTech, have recently tested this in the Cayman Islands, Malaysia, and Brazil. And, um, but before releasing this strain and field testing it, uh, he actually approached Greenpeace and asked them, hey, what do you think about this technology? And they thought about it for a while, and then they got back to him and said, well, actually, we're pretty much against everything genetically modified. And what this points out is that genetic engineering has become a hugely polarized issue in our society. That there are people who are entirely for it, and then there are people who, regardless of the application, they oppose it. What I'd like to argue is that depending, if, if we have the right people in the lab coats, then we can do some really great things with genetic engineering. But the problem is that its reputation has been harmed by what's known as the first generation of GM crops. And these are what, what gives it the reputation that a lot of people today might talk down about GMOs. Um, it doesn't have to be this way. But the first generation of GM crops, they make money for the corporations that sell them. And they make money for the farmers that grow them. Or else, why would they grow them? But um, when it comes to the consumers, there are very little benefits. And then it's the consumers who take, take on the human health risks. So there's really no reason for a consumer to choose a GM food. Um, and so in the US, you actually don't have a choice because, because they're not labeled. And then in, the, um, in Europe, the, the feeds are made mostly to livestock because people wouldn't choose them. They are labeled. <laughs> um, but the truth is that they do have some benefits. So it would be unfair to say that they don't have any. Um, they do lead to increased productivity, which reduces food prices. And then the BT varieties, which have an insecticidal um, toxin in them, they actually do reduce reliance on toxic pesticides, which is beneficial for the environment. Uh, many of these benefits are actually invisible to consumers, which doesn't help with the uh, public approval. But the fact is that the non-GM varieties of foods that were already out there before these came along were already perfectly adequate. So there was really, when the GM foods came along, there was really no reason to choose them. And further to that, what people saw was GM foods produced by multinational corporations like Monsanto. So they saw that Monsanto made money out of genetic engineering and large amounts of it, but they didn't trust that. Uh, they saw Percy Schmeiser, who was a farmer, he was sued by Monsanto because GM seeds contaminated his field from a neighboring field. Um, they saw that Monsanto made GM crops that resisted their own patented herbicide. So that if you wanted to use a herbicide, you had to buy the GM crops. 
And then we saw uh, terminator technology, which is seeds or GM crops that are unable to produce fertile seeds, which means that farmers had to buy new seeds from Monsanto every single season. So basically, in summary, what they saw was Mr. Burns, a corporate entity that they really didn't trust. So, yeah, what I'd like to argue is that these are not issues with genetic engineering per se, but rather issues with the genetic engineer, and it's quite unfair to the public. And if we had a different genetic engineer with a more generous public face for technology, the public attitudes may also change. So at this point, I'd like to invite you into a parallel universe, an alternate reality, where Mother Teresa, not Mr. Burns, is the public face of genetic engineering. In this universe, Mother Teresa, instead of starting a new religious order with hundreds of missions around the world, she starts a multinational genetic engineering enterprise. And for her efforts at fighting against the terrible problems of poverty and disease, she wins the Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. In this universe, Mother Teresa is really Dr. Mother Teresa, genetic engineer and chairperson of one fainter. <laughs> right, I was actually lying there, mentioned um, the one fainter shirt. It's actually I between A and the end here, and um, this, this isn't actually a T, it's a cross. <laughs> Monsanto is the genetic engineering enterprise of the parallel universe. And with Mother Teresa, <laughs> with Mother Teresa at its helm, this is the parallel universe over here, um, it produces foods that benefit the poor. Its first goal is to improve the nutrition of developing countries, to address their nutritional deficiencies. Its second goal is to reduce hunger by increasing food yields. Goal number three is to fight against global warming by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And goal number four is to prevent the spread of some of the most deadly diseases in the world today. I'd like to go into each of these goals in a little bit of detail, but um, start with a little spoiler, just to mention that many of these goals are already well underway. So let's start with goal number one, improve, improving nutrition, and specifically the example of golden rice. This is a variety of rice designed to fight one of the biggest scourges of the world today, vitamin A deficiency. Here in the West, you may hear that and think, well, what's the problem with vitamins? Or, um, we can get vitamins very easily. We're not usually deficient. We are, we can just take a supplement. But in developing countries, it's actually a huge problem. And vitamin A deficiency causes a daily death toll of several thousand. Um, it's actually a serious, it's a disaster has a death toll on the order of the Fukushima tsunami on a daily basis, only it's not in the newspapers. Um, it, has, it also is a, the leading cause of child blindness around the world. And sadly, many of these children will actually die within a year of losing their sight. Um, Swiss Professor Ingo Petritus and colleagues figured that rice would be a really excellent way to try and distribute vitamin A to those in need. That's because rice is a staple crop for half the world's population. But at the same time, it's a very poor source of many nutrients, vitamin A included. So they found a way to engineer rice with beta carotene from daffodils, and they also threw in a, a gene from soil bacteria, I don't know why. Um, but beta carotene is actually the nutrient that is converted into vitamin A after you eat it. And it's also the nutrient that gives daffodils their yellow color, which is why golden rice is golden. And in true Monsanto spirit, the creators of golden rice have actually donated it and made it freely available to any country willing to take it. Um, I give it, if I may, Mother Teresa's close to human seal of approval. <laughs> and that's the benefit of having a CEO who's, who's already moved on to the afterlife. You can approve things on their behalf. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, now moving on to goal number two, reducing hunger through increasing food yields. A few people today have mentioned um, that, uh, well, there's, uh, the argument is that there's enough food to go around today. Um, the problem is really one of distribution. And that may be the case right now. But the human race is taking the biblical command 
to um, be fruitful and multiply, perhaps a little bit too seriously. <laughs> and um, the global population is actually increasing by 6 million people every day. That's a trend that isn't slowing down right now. And that's an increase larger than my home country, New Zealand, on a daily basis. So the way I think about it, to feed an additional New Zealand, it's actually one and a half New Zealand, um, so be three islands instead of two. Um, <laughs> to feed an additional New Zealand every single day, every, actually month, um, we're probably going to have to increase food efficiency in every way possible. So one way to increase food efficiency is to decrease losses due to poor storage, handling, and distribution. But uh, genetic engineering has a crucial role to play when it comes to viruses and bacteria which devastate crops and insect pests. So I'd like to use the example of the banana, which is a key source of sustenance in Africa. Um, actually, in Uganda, it serves this one third of the calorie intake every day. Um, people in Uganda eat bananas for every meal. That was until a devastating bacterial disease hit the crop. And you can see here, it basically rots the crop from the inside out. Um, it affected almost every single farm in Uganda, and some, in some cases it wiped out entire fields of bananas. The bananas actually sterile, um, so there's, it's a little bit more difficult to use natural selection to um, generate more varieties that could help fight the disease. So they actually, Ugandan scientists, not um, Monsanto or you know, Western scientists, Ugandan scientists actually approached this problem by genetically modifying bananas so that they could fight off this bacterial disease. And their hope is that they can restore food security to their nation by protecting the crop against the disease. And they're not really doing this with, with banana. They've actually already done this with papaya. They're working on it with cassava, uh, sweet potatoes, a bunch of other crops. So genetic engineering could have a great role in increasing food security. Goal number three is to fight global warming. Uh, Agriculture, genetic engineering may have a, quite a big role in reducing global warming. That's because agriculture accounts for 87% of global consumptive land use. So if we were able to make agriculture more efficient, we could have a hugely beneficial effect on the environment. And one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions is nitrogen <coughs> fertilizer, which produces the environmentally devastating nitrous oxide. A greenhouse gas 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Arcadia Bioscience, is a California biotech company, have actually been working on a trait called nitrogen use efficiency, which increases the efficiency of plants so they can take out more nitrogen from the soil, or take it out more efficiently. And what this means is that you can use less nitrogen fertilizer and have the same crop yield. And if you use less fertilizer, then you produce less nitrous oxide, which is less greenhouse gas emissions. They inserted this gene into uh, genetically modified canola, and they found that they can achieve the same yield if they decrease fertilizer usage by two-thirds. So they only use one-third the amount they used to use. And to put this figure into perspective, if you actually, um, on a global scale, if you did this, you could actually have a similar effect as well, actually, if you did half that, if, if you reduced nitrogen fertilizer usage by one third throughout the world, you could actually have a bigger effect on greenhouse gas emissions than if you grounded every single airplane on the planet. So with selective use of genetic engineering, and if it was taken up on a wide scale, we actually do have the power to have a bigger impact than outlawing flying. And I quite like visiting LA, so I'd, I'd rather we did this. <laughs> Now moving on to goal number four, preventing the spread of some of the world's most deadly diseases. Um, we've seen how with the vitamin A deficiency, we can use golden rice to reduce some of its symptoms. Um, when it comes to HIV, scientists have come up with a slightly more, slightly more imaginative approach. They've been genetically modifying tobacco, and they also have a genetically modified living condom. Both of which perhaps may require a little explanation for you. <laughs> so let's start with uh, genetically modified tobacco. Uh, the approach scientists have taken here is to produce antibodies 
that neutralize HIV before it has a chance to infect a new person. And um, they've actually isolated the gene that expresses this antibody and then inserted it into the tobacco genome so that it's expressed in tobacco leaves. And then they take the tobacco leaves, cut them off, shred them and pulverize them into this green sludge here, which kind of resembles um, broccoli and spinach detox soup. Um, it's a different kind of detox soup, I guess. Um, but the interesting thing is they actually use tobacco because people don't make soup out of it. Um, the detox tobacco soup may not be the most impressive on tray at a dinner party, but, but there's been talk for some time about engineering vaccines into food, but the problem is that people would end up eating the vaccines without knowing about it, and that goes against the medical ethical principle of autonomy. So instead what they do is they take the sludge here, they extract the antibodies, purify them, and then they use them to create a gel which uh, fights HIV and can be applied by women before sex. And this is very relevant in places where, in countries where men may refuse to use condoms, and it's difficult to, for women to um, disagree, and then women can take control over their health outcomes by using something like this. But an alternative approach <laughs> is the GM living condom, which has the same effect. Um, in this case, vaginal bacteria are actually taken and genetically modified so that they produce molecules that prevent HIV from entering new cells. And um, the vaginal bacteria wants to be used to form a gel, which can be applied before sex. It forms a condom-like barrier against HIV, which, because it's living, it lasts for weeks rather than hours, which means that it can be applied days before sex. A lab in Italy have actually been working on one of these living condoms, and they've um, produced one with the strongest known HIV inhibitors known to men. Um, and they actually, I actually got in touch with them for this talk, and they asked me, well, what would Mother Teresa think about it? And the truth is that she opposed condoms while opening AIDS hospices, but she never said anything about living condoms. <laughs> um, so I actually gave them an enthusiastic green light on her behalf. <laughs> but another thing is that uh, condoms serve as uh, generally serve as uh, contraception, and that was what she opposed. But living condoms actually don't; they just uh, block against HIV. Um, so that's another reason why we're pretty sure that she would support this technology. And then we have the GM mosquito, which is the project that I contribute to. Mosquitoes are actually very relevant to global health, uh, not very relevant to food, but um, for global health, they actually kill more people than people do. And so we've been working on doing gene therapy on mosquitoes, uh, trying to engineer with genes and with genes that prevent them from getting malaria. And if you prevent a mosquito from getting malaria, then you also prevent the dip from giving it to a person. Then we've been working on ways to spread these genes into populations so that all, may, all mosquitoes may one day be malaria-free. And we believe that uh, Mother Teresa would also support this technology because um, she actually personally suffers from malaria herself towards the end of her life, and it's a disease that primarily affects the poor. And there's also a really good insect restaurant in Santa Monica to bring it back to food. <laughs> um, so there you have it, the 2012 Monsanto development line, feeding the planet, preventing some of the world's most deadly diseases, and um, putting stop to global warming. And although I've been using Mother Teresa as Monsanto's front woman, the truth is that we can do it without her. All we need is a body double, actually. Um, do you have an elderly Albanian nun in audience? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, seriously, all of the inventions that I've talked about here are inventions of people in this universe, not a parallel universe, this one. Uh, using, realizing the remarkable potential of genetic engineering and using it for the public good. And my request is that we support these technologies and encourage the genetic engineering industry to do the same. Genetic engineering has so much potential if we can only overcome its, the bad reputation that's obtained over the years. And with Mother Teresa, at least figuratively in the driving seat, I personally can't imagine a better person playing God. Thanks. <laughs>